Welcome back everyone. We are going to begin turning our attention to law enforcement and policing structures. In this lecture, we will be focusing on law enforcement from a historical perspective. Unlike your prior lectures, the background information is most important here. This is really an evolutionary lecture, beginning with the creation of the English tithing system. Let's go ahead and get started. We see that the totality of our policing agencies is quite large and often very diverse. Those 18,000 agencies are comprised of local, state, and federal agencies. This includes specialized agencies ranging from university police departments all the way up through the FBI, or the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It also includes the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and ICE, or Immigration and Customs Enforcement. These specialized agencies have a very narrow area of crimes that they are able to go after. Often, when you get to the federal level, you have agencies like the FBI and the ATF that are working together because the cause would really involve both parties. This narrow area of power refers to the agency's jurisdictional power. So this means that certain agencies can only have the power to enforce laws in certain geographic areas for certain types of crimes and for certain types of offenders. So let's look at a jurisdictional example. The Tyler Police Department has jurisdictional rights for the city of Tyler. Smith County Sheriff's Department has jurisdictional rights for the entire county. Their reach overlaps that of the Tyler Police Department. The Texas Ranger Division has statewide jurisdiction that overlaps the Smith County Sheriff and the Tyler PD. This means that the Tyler PD cannot make an arrest outside of city limits, but the, the Smith Carey County Sheriff's Department rather can make an arrest anywhere inside the county. They cannot make an arrest outside of county lines. The Texas Rangers are allowed to make an arrest anywhere within the state of Texas, but their jurisdiction ends at the state line. So as I began this lecture, I told you that this was going to be more of a look at policing from a historical perspective. Like most of the country's legal system, policing gets its roots in England with the tithing system. The tithing system starts the first organized structure of policing, but it really didn't have anything to do with protecting ordinary citizens like we associate with the police today. Instead, tithing was set up as a way to protect the king's interest and to get revenge against those who tried to rise against him. But even though the purpose of organized law enforcement has changed over the centuries, the structure still has its roots within this tithing system. This is really the foundation of modern day policing. The levels of the tithing system are similar to jurisdictions. So let's look at the levels of tithing. First, we have a group of 10 families, which is known as the tithing. 10 tithings equals 100, and several hundreds equal a shire. The shire was overseen by one individual, who is the shire reeve, who later turns into what we know as the sheriff. So there is the sh shire reeve, or the sheriff, who oversees the entire shire. But that's a lot of ground for one man to cover, so he is going to be helped by his posses, equivalent to modern day sheriff's deputies. The posses is scattered throughout the Shire and works to keep crime levels down, and also works to apprehend criminals when they did break the law. The posse would often enforce the punishment once the criminal was found guilty of the accused crime. Jump forward a few hundred years and we get a better organized and a uniformed police force. The Industrial Revolution is famous for many things, including job growth, bringing more workers into urban areas, and the mass production of materials like steel and oil. But what happens when you start putting a lot more people into a dense urban environment like London? You end up getting a lot more crime. And as crime levels increase, so does the need to keep those crime levels low. So in 1829, we see the creation of the London Metropolitan Police Force. This is one of the strongest first examples of a metropolitan police force. It grew out of the need to supervise and govern an ever-growing population, but later adapted its needs and its roles in London as industry started to dissipate later on. It, be it began with ten a thousand members and they abided by the Peel's principles of policing. On page 141 of your textbook, it lays out the 12 principles that Peel expected his officers to abide by while in uniform, as a representation of their monarch. They used a military-like 
police structure, including ranks like sergeant and lieutenant, and a hierarchical structure. This police force really set the tone for what was about to take place in the United States. We all know that American territories were colonized in the late 1600s and the early 1700s. The colonists were for the most part English, so it made sense that they brought their English system of government with them. Before the revolution, they were still English subjects and they were still overseen by the crown. The colonists bought the co constable watch system with them and originally used this style of policing. But once cities started to develop and grow, it was clear that the constable watch system was no longer working. Instead, larger cities started emulating the uniform police force that became famous in London. Having that organization was fantastic for larger cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. But then, westward expansion started in earnest and there was a lot of undeveloped territory that suddenly needed a police presence. The uniform police departments of the Northeast were not appropriate in the western rural areas of the United States. Instead, western territories and states turned to the sheriff and posse system that we mentioned earlier when we spoke of the tithing system from England. It was better suited for covering large amounts of land at one time. The United States has more police departments than any other nation in the world. Very large populations need a strong police presence. Virtually every community has its own police force, creating a great disparity in the quality of American police personnel and even service. We've already discussed the Industrial Revolution once before, but in connection with the London Metropolitan Police Department. Just like what happened in London, an influx of workers were flooding cities to be able to work at the factories located there. However, U.S. cities are growing a lot faster than London did. There is a lot more land available in America and American factory owners are able to produce their products faster and cheaper due in part to the growing, quickly growing labor pool that was coming over from Europe. European immigration is causing the numbers to grow in a lot of these cities. Not only did you have a growing population in these larger urban areas, but you have a diverse population that did not always get along together. You had a lot of different immigrant groups who preferred to keep to themselves and not interact with others. If you go to places like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and even Pittsburgh, you still have a lot of neighborhoods that are predominantly Polish or German and Italian and so on. During the large European immigration booms, these immigrants often stayed with people coming from their own nationality. This led to fights and brawls when others started moving into these often segregated areas. Additionally, you had a lot of the same individuals who were fighting for the same jobs. The living conditions were not ideal. A lot of poor immigrants had to live in tenement buildings which were cramped, dirty, and often unsafe. Unions fought with employers trying to get better working conditions for workers, and employers often countered with layoffs and lower wages. Overall, it was a turbulent time in many large cities and it required an increased police presence. Many of these cities never had such large metropolitan police forces before, and a lot of citizens were wary of them. A lot of Americans were used to limited supervision and did not always welcome a uniform police force with open arms. Therefore, the use of plainclothes officers continued, but these plainclothes watchmen did not try to prevent or even discover crime. It was not until the mid-1800s that we see uniforms start to appear. No longer are the police totally in plain clothes, but we see the establishment of a controlled appearance that was continuous across officers. We also s start to see designations for the officers' ranks, much like a military structure. New York becomes the cornerstone of American police departments. Even today, it is one of the largest police departments in the United States. Not only do we see a more formalized policing structure, but we also see a lot of corruption occurring as well. The police accepted bribes and allowed for organized crime to take root in their city. But the corruption was not seen everywhere. Other cities began using the New York model in the creation of their own police departments, and by the end of the century, nearly all major cities east of the Mississippi had formed municipal police departments with uniformed officers who carried nightsticks and later firearms. This is a photo of officers belonging to the New York City Metropolitan Police Force 
taken in 1871. You'll notice that they are all simil similarly dressed, sorry, in their uniforms, and they carry batons as the previous slide suggested. There are a difference in the hats that the officers are wearing. This is most likely due to a difference in rank. On page 143 of your textbook, you will notice that the differences in hats and the stripes of the officers' coats. These are also due to differences in rank. As we see policing really start to take a firm hold in the United States, we see that there isn't much regulation regarding who can be an officer, what the training criteria was, or even if there was an educational requirement. None of this mattered at the beginning when there was not a rigorous qualification standard. Today things are much different. We require officers to go through the academy, to have some college education, to pass background checks, and to pass other types of physical testing. In the 1880s, Cincinnati is beginning to recognize some of the issues that come along with hiring just anyone to be a police officer. They advertise that police officers must be men of high moral character and they must be fast runners. It's great that Cincinnati is starting to show some sort of reform so that not just anyone can become a police officer. However, having high moral character could be very different from today. For example, a police officer might beat his wife as a form of discipline. It's okay for the time period, but that's not something that any agency would approve of in 2015. Additionally, it's probably a great thing that the officers are fast. No police cars in the late 1800s, so they're going to need to be able to chase down offenders. Horses are available, yes, but remember that these large cities are full of people and horses cannot go everywhere that people go. But what about important things like education or standardized testing? Police academies were not mandatory like they are today. It was not until the early 20th century that reformers began advocating for training and education of police officers. Reformers also aimed to remove the police from political influences. However, in cities like Chicago that were being ruled by organized crime, it was very unlikely that the officers were not being bribed. Remember that there were many different influential spheres that had a hand in governing our people. It was a turbulent time and even though the reformers had good ideas, they were not able to eliminate that corruption completely. From the early 1900s to, uh, until 1972, when the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission began to assist women police, off women police officers in obtaining equal employment status with male officers, police women were responsible for the protection and crime prevention work only with women and juveniles particularly with young girls. But these women were not able to play the same policing roles that men were allowed to perform. One of the biggest roles that women were given were keeping the sexual activity of young girls in check. Remember the time period we're talking about here. Women don't even have the right to vote yet when the first women are being hired at police departments. If they cannot vote, it doesn't seem very likely that they're going to be treated as equals on a predominantly male police force. This is a picture of the first female police officers that were hired by the Chicago Police Department. Note that they don't even have uniforms like the men did. Some police departments, like Los Angeles, chose to provide the women uniforms. At this point, Chicago was not one of those departments. Chicago's Police Department's first female officers in 1913, their starting salary for a policewoman was $75 a month and each officer was assigned an area to patrol. It often included a beach, a park, a bus terminal, a railway station, or a dance hall. Their duties included protecting girls from unsavory types who might lure them into danger and arresting girls for wearing questionable swimming costumes at the local beaches. To some extent, Americans have always been somewhat opposed to police and have been at odds with their role. We are currently seeing that more and more across the country in the last few years. But since the first metropolitan police forces were created, we have never really known what role we want the police to play. Do we want them to be keep peacekeepers or social workers? Do we want them to only fight crime and take a law enforcement role? Or do we want them to do a combination of these things? For the most part, we have seen a mixture of all of those roles over the years. Our police force was largely rooted in peacekeeping and officers did that role through the end of the 19th century. 
early in the 1900s, we see a shift taking place towards crime fighting and a law enforcement role. In the 1960s, we see the crime fighting role occur, but there was a large disparity in how the police played their role and how the general public perceived them doing so. As you know, the 1960s were very turbulent. You had two large issues taking place that sparked large-scale protests and sometimes even riots. The first is the fight for civil rights, and the second are the protests over the Vietnam War. You probably know some of what have occur occurred, and, you don't and we don't have time today to make our way through the entire chronology of the events that took place in the 1960s. But as African Americans, largely in the South, continued to fight for equality, there was a backlash from a lot of white Southerners who were perfectly content with th keeping things as they were for the last few decades. There was a lot of peaceful protests, but sometimes those protests turned violent. When the crowds of marchers and protests refused to break up, sometimes the police would use their police dogs to break up the crowds. Another favorite was the use of high pressure fire hoses to soak the protesters. If you've seen these high pressure water hoses, the same ones that they used to put out fires, you know how much water comes out of there at a time. The police would not stand very far away from the protesters, but instead would spray them from about 10 to 15 feet away at the most. That amount of pressure hurts very badly, and it often left people bleeding and bruised on the streets. You can imagine that when these instances occurred, it resulted in citizens feeling at odds with the police and feeling less supportive of their presence. Your book actually shows a picture of some of the racial conflicts that were happening with the police in the 1960s. In part, the violence of the 1960s spurred the discussion for change. There had to be a different way to do things in order, for some, in order to avoid some of the conflicts that we saw during that time. In the 1970s, researchers started to promote the idea that apprehending offenders does not do enough to try and control the crime problem, but instead the police have the duty to try and stop crime before it even occurs. Working together with the police departments, they have developed the concept of community policing. Basically, this means that if you can identify the problem neighborhoods and allow the police to develop a relationship with those individuals living there, then you can work together to reduce crime. The problem is that you have to get the communities to buy into this idea and not everyone is trusting of the police, especially given the circumstances that occurred in the 1960s. Police still, people still remember that rather. So now you have to combat those memories as well when you're trying to gain the community's trust. Community policing basically takes a problem solving approach and requires the police to look for solutions to those issues that are important to a given community. There is no longer a blanket solution in just arresting people after a crime has occurred. The police have to send, spend more time in the communities on foot patrol. They have to actually get out of their cars, walk around, talk to people, patron local restaurants, remember people's names, and interact with community members a lot more. If the police can establish more of a human relationship with community members, rather than keeping an authoritative distance from them, the literature suggests that the community is more willing to help the police when crimes do occur. The rest of the chapter goes on to talk about the establishment and the history of specialized agencies like the U.S. Marshal Service, the Secret Service, the FBI, and the DEA. These federal agencies serve a specialized purpose for the federal government, but can work closely with local and state agencies if the need occurs. The book is a good overview of these organizations, so make sure you take the time to read over them. The next lecture for this unit is going to take us into the exploration of more modern functions of policing. So join me next time when we take a look at Chapter 6 of the textbook. Have a great day, everyone.